Hey all and welcome back to this really fun tutorial. In this video, I'll be going through all the steps to create a HO scale model of The Simpsons House. I used to watch this show non-stop as a kid, so what better way to bring back those fun memories than with a diorama that can sit up on my shelf. This video is sponsored by Anycubic, and I'll be using their new 3D printer to help build this model, which I'll talk about a little bit later. In the meantime, sit back and watch as this really cool model comes together. As with many of my 3D printed objects, it starts in Tinkercad. A simple, easy to use 3D design program that's free. I won't go through the entire process for designing the 3D model. Making simple geometric shapes like a house is actually quite straightforward. With a bit of practice, you'll master the simple design before you know it. In any case, I'll make all the parts to build this house available to download and change using links to this Tinkercad project. I used a model of Homer that was downloaded and imported into Tinkercad. He was scaled to be HO scale, and then the rest of the house was built around Homer using him as a reference on how big the house needed to be. I used screenshots from the cartoon to get a rough dimension and shape of the house. The rest is just guessing and a bit of trial and error until I ended up with something that looked reasonably close. Once happy all the parts are exported as STL files. To prepare the model for 3D printing, I'm using the new version of Anycubic Photon Workshop. I specifically sized the house so that it would fit just within the build volume boundary. Now it's just a matter of adding supports, which is made very easy using the auto supports. The model gets sliced, and once saved, the model is ready to print. This is the latest Anycubic printer. It's the Photon Mono M5S Pro. Basically what differentiates this from the previous M5S model is the air heater and purifier, and the ultra high 14K resolution. It provides an XY resolution of 16.8 by 24.8 microns, as well as 85% light uniformity, meaning it better retains detail across the entire build plate. Just like the previous model, it comes with a screen protector. The resin vat also uses their quick release film. It looks cloudy, but it's intentional and enables the use of high speed resin. It also auto levels, so you shouldn't need to do any leveling to get a successful print. I wish all printers did this because it makes it so much easier just to load up a model and hit print, knowing that it will adhere perfectly to the build plate every time. The heater purifier is a separate unit that is stuck to the inside of the printer using tape. It would be nice if it was built into the unit itself, but for what it is, it works well. You just need to make sure the cord slips into the notch when the lid is in place. The heater is great for people in colder climates. Resin prints best at around 30 to 35 degrees. For me, it's not really needed. I live in a very hot part of Australia and the temperature without the heater running sits at around 35 degrees in the garage. So I just turn the heat all the way down to 10 degrees. That way I can have the fan run and see what the temperature inside the printer actually gets to. I also use the purifier to help clean the air. For this model, I'm also using the high speed resin. This stuff works really well. The entire house took less than an hour. Normally using standard resin, it would take at least three hours. With the aircon running, I managed to get the garage down to about 29 degrees. However, once the print starts, it doesn't take long for it to warm up inside the printer. Fifty minutes later and it's done. Once the model is cleaned off in a bath of isopropyl alcohol, it is post-cured for about 10 minutes to cure any remaining resin. Resin printing is really the only option for printing highly detailed models, and being able to use fast resin makes the process all that much faster. The supports will need to be removed. Depending on the part and its level of detail, you'll want to be gentle. Resin is quite brittle for the most part and can easily chip or break apart as you're removing the supports. Additionally, resin, especially long flat sections, have a tendency to warp. This can be corrected by gently forcing the warp back and applying heat, leaving the weight on as it cools back down so that it holds its new position. Now for the roof. This is also exported from Tinkercad, however this time it's an SVG file. 
To export as SVG, the part needs to intersect the floor plane first. Sometimes that means making it thicker so that you can lower it through the floor like this. After it's been exported, I then import it into Photoshop. Here I can add a border to it and orientate it so that I can print it out on some paper. These templates are cut out and stuck onto 1mm styrene that will be used for the roof sections. I tend to use 3M Super 77 spray adhesive for this because it works exceptionally well with paper. The styrene is quite thin so a sharp hobby knife is more than enough to cut out the roof shapes. Because the styrene is thin, it also likes to warp, especially after painting. So styrene strips are used as bracing for the underside of each roof section. Now we're ready to start painting. Painting resin is just like any other plastic model. They need to be cleaned, then a primer layer, and finish with their main paint layer. I used an acrylic filler primer for these parts. I find it works well to hide any possible layer lines and fill any tiny imperfections. It's also a nice base colour and close to the colour for the house. After priming the house, I noticed a bit of warping and it flexed really easily. I could fix this by reprinting with an improved internal structure to limit warping, however I decided to use my laser cutter to cut out some 3mm acrylic to create an internal brace that I can just press into the model. I just need to keep in mind that I need access to the inside to fit the windows and doors. Drawing a line helps guide where to apply the epoxy and also helps me line up the internal brace so that it's square. A quick test shows that it should work. Before gluing, I rough up the surface so the glue will be able to stick to the acrylic better. I use two part epoxy, mainly because it's strong and once set it's not going anywhere, but it's also fast and after about 10 to 15 minutes, I can move on to the other sections of the model. To ensure that it sets in the right spot with as little warping as possible, I use some small clamps to hold everything in place as the epoxy hardened. Now that it's braced, it's much more rigid and definitely won't warp over time. The last bit of sanding ensures the base is nice and flat. The roof peaks also need a little bracing, which is done with some bamboo skewers. Now is a good time to install the chimney. I didn't show it, but there are two lines that mark where the top of the chimney needs to be positioned so the roof edges will fit properly. I also accidentally broke the chimney while trying to reposition it. Nothing a bit of putty and some sanding can't fix. When it comes to painting the house, I basically used trial and error to get the colour. I had a whole variety of paints and mixed them willy nilly until I found something that worked. So don't ask what the ratio is, it was a complete guess and I probably wouldn't be able to get the same colour a second time. I used a printed out picture to help get the colour I wanted. It's not perfect, but to be honest the house colour changes depending on what season of The Simpsons you watch. A nice even coat was applied with the airbrush, and in the end the colour wasn't too far off. All the other details were painted as well, using reference images to get the colour just about right. Liquid PSA was used to add glazing to the windows. The back of the frame was painted with PSA and then left to dry. After 5 minutes the PSA turns clear and then each window is stuck to a very thin sheet of plastic film. Old clear plastic packaging would work as well. Next the windows are cut free from the plastic film. The window interiors are simply screenshots from the actual Simpsons house, erasing everything except the window itself. I did a little tidy up in Photoshop and then scaled them to fit each window frame. Once cut out they are stuck to the back of the window frame using a small dab of PSA in the corners. 
Now they are ready to be installed. This time I'm using some tacky craft glue in the corners so that when each window is pressed into position, they will hold in place. Only a small amount of glue is needed, just in case I need to pop them back out to fix. The bay windows are a little bit different. These needed to be cut out a little bit more precise and I score the plastic film along a black line I added in Photoshop to help create the bend so that it fits in the form of the window. The doors are designed to slide in and fixed with some glue. The roof is undercoated with a brown spray paint. This is then covered with brown paper that is colour matched with the roof from the cartoon and has some random roof marks added just like what you see in the cartoon. Each section of roof is sprayed with spray adhesive and then pressed down onto paper. I made it so there is some overhang so that the paper doesn't have to line up perfectly straight away. The white edge of the paper is coloured in with some brown texture. Fixing the roof onto the house is also done with some craft tacky glue. Again, I only apply a few drops along the ridge so that if for any reason I need to remove the roof, I can do so with minimal damage. Now for the rest of the detail. Because I'm painting with yellow, I find using a white primer layer before applying the yellow works best. You can see once the white is down, the yellow final colour shows up much better. The rest of the detail is painted the old fashioned way, using a brush. Being as patient as possible, especially when trying to paint the eyes. For the trees I'm using Woodland Scenics tree armatures. These worked perfectly. They were easy to bend using some pliers. I had to bend them quite aggressively so the tree house would sit in the right spot, but as you will see it looks quite natural even with the branches bent at a right angle. You may also need to completely remove some branches. Once happy the tree house is glued in with some epoxy. Just like all the other detail, the tree is painted. Not too specifically, just an undercoat of red ochre and then a brownish layer over the top and then a final bit of dry brushing with some warm grey. Also the roof of the tree house is made with some ice cream sticks. It doesn't have to be too precise because you'll never really see these at the normal viewing angles. For the foliage, again I'm using Woodland Scenics. The green polyfiber allows me to add volume and shape to the canopy by teasing it out nice and thin and then placing it across the tree armature. Doing my best to create a bit of cartoon style shape to the canopy. To attach the coarse turf, I spray the tree with Sally's spray adhesive. I like this brand over the 3M adhesive because it's nice and thin. Next the tree is covered in a medium green coarse turf covering all of the polyfiber material. Multiple coats of spray adhesive and coarse turf will need to be applied until you get a nice thick coverage over the tree. The turf that sticks to the trunk can be brushed away as needed. A small amount of fine turf burnt grass is also applied for a bit of color variety. And lastly, I didn't show it on camera, but I sprayed the finished tree with Tamiya Flat Clear to seal everything in place and to help eliminate the tackiness of any spray adhesive on the branches. Now for the diorama base. There's not a lot to it. Basically the position of the details are drawn onto some paper and then using that as a guide some plywood was cut out for the base. I also added some edges to the base to help prevent the plywood from warping. The footpath, driveway and house foundation is made using PVC foam board. A template for the footpath was cut out from the paper I used earlier. Then that can be stuck onto the PVC foam board temporarily so that it can be cut out. A good sharp hobby knife cuts through this stuff with ease. Once everything is cut out, the paper is peeled away, I can mark out the footpath lines. I cut a shallow groove with the hobby knife 
and then use the Tamiya plastic scriber to widen the groove a little bit. This process is repeated for all of the pavement lines. The driveway slope is carefully sanded using a Dremel. It's important to take small layers off at a time because this stuff sands really easily and very fast if you're not too careful. The road section was cut out using 1.5mm styrene sheet. Before painting, both the footpath and road are lightly sanded so that it gives a nice surface for the paint to stick to. For the bottom of the footpath and road I sanded with a very coarse grit sandpaper so that the glue will have a better chance of sticking. Whilst the glue sets I weigh it down so that it doesn't move. For the footpath I have a bit of a painting technique. First is Woodland Scenic Cement, diluted down so that it can be applied through the airbrush. I apply a good even coverage over the entire footpath area. Next is a greenish grey colour. This is applied through the airbrush with the air pressure turned all the way down. This results in a speckled appearance. This is also applied right across the surface of the footpath. It doesn't have to be even, a bit of variation can add to the effect. Then to tie it all back together, a thin coat of the cement colour is applied. Just enough so that the speckled texture is visible underneath. Lastly, an oil wash is applied using Starship Filth diluted with thinners. This layer is liberally applied over the footpath and then using a paper towel, excess is dabbed away. This leaves oil in the lines as well as giving a nice weathered effect to the footpath surface. The road is painted very similar. However, for this, I'm using Rust-Oleum Grey Primer for the base. For the speckled top coat, I'm using Rust-Oleum Heirloom White, sprayed at a distance and very fast to give a speckled look. For weathering I use a black brown acrylic wash, applied just the same as the oil wash on the footpath. I'm not using the oil here because the oil thinners reacts with the Rust-Oleum paint, whereas the acrylic doesn't. Now for the lines, in the Simpsons it looks like the road lines are yellow. To prevent the paint bleeding under the tape, I first apply a clear coat. This fills in any gaps in the masking tape. Next white is used, and then that's followed up with the yellow colour. Now the road can be glued down in position, again using weights to ensure it's nice and flat and doesn't move. With the house placed, I figure out a good spot for the trees. I'm using the base that holds the tree. Once positioned, those bases are marked and then glued down. I make sure to have the foliage of the tree inside the edge of the diorama. Later on, I'll probably create an acrylic case to act as a lid for this diorama so that it can be displayed in a shop and also to keep dust off the model while it's on the shelf. Now for some dirt. I want to build up the base layer so that it's about 1 to 2 millimeters below the level of the footpath. To do this I paint Mod Podge mat over the entire base where I want dirt. The Mod Podge is diluted about 1 to 1 with water to make it a little more runny. Next a layer of dirt is sprinkled across the surface. The glue will soak up into this initial layer of dirt, giving the entire area an even coating. After about 10 minutes, I tip the diorama up to remove excess dirt. Next, a second layer is applied, doing my best to build up this layer to the height I want and also trying to give a good even distribution of dirt across the surface. Any excess is brushed away with a nice soft brush. This layer is permanently fixed down, first misting over some wet water which is some tap water mixed with a few drops of dish soap so that it helps soak down into the dirt. Any excess water is soaked away with a paper towel. Next a layer of glue is applied. This is also Mod Podge, however it's diluted 4 parts water to 1 part Mod Podge with a few drops of dish soap. I keep applying this until you can just see a whitish tint to the dirt. Don't worry because it will dry clear once it sets.
After a few hours it should be dry enough to apply grass. For this I'm using Woodland Scenic Static King along with a mixture of their 4mm grass, light and medium green. Mix to get a nice mild green colour. Undiluted Mod Podge is painted over all the areas of dirt, trying my best to avoid getting glue on the footpath and driveway. Now for the fun part. Holding the grounding wire close to the applicator, I simply shake it about 3 to 4 centimeters above the surface and the grass will come out and stick into the glue vertically. It all happens pretty fast and it makes a huge difference to the look of the diorama once finished. Once done the diorama is flipped over and any excess grass is gently tapped away. Don't forget to save the excess for future dioramas. The grass generally sticks down well, however I find it needs a coat of glue to really help it stick in place. I mask off the road and driveway and then spray a layer of the diluted Mod Podge so that it soaks into the grass. This will create a very strong layer that can handle a bit of wear and tear. Any excess glue is mopped up with a paper towel. Now is also a good time to attach the patio using some epoxy to hold it down. The fences were 3D printed and the brick fence came out a bit wonky, mostly due to the way it was designed. But instead of redesigning it and reprinting, I tried fixing it with some ice cream sticks and epoxy. For the most part it worked. It worked well enough to paint it up and still look okay for the diorama. The wooden picket fence was also 3D printed. It was designed to be glued together in sections using some super glue. Once assembled and painted it looks quite good. In order to add the fences I used a ruler to get a nice straight line from the front to the back of the diorama. Next the static grass along that line is scraped away using some tweezers. This leaves a nice line in the grass and the fence can be glued down. The grass fibers help hold the fence upright and once the glue dries it won't tip over. The same is done for the brick fence on the other side as well. Other details can be added now as well, like the bin and the letterbox. I'm not adding lights in this video, however for a future upgrade I'm drilling two holes in the base so that I can add lighting later on. For fixing the house I'm using Helmar Super Tack Glue. I only apply a small amount of glue around the base just in case I need to remove the house later on at some stage. And I can't forget the tiny barbecue. Trees and shrubs are added with some Woodland Scenics fine leaf foliage. This stuff is my favourite bush material. It's perfect for these types of bushes and also makes great small trees as well. The larger trees are super simple to add using the base we glued down earlier. Now all we need to do is add Marge's car which is a commercial wagon model I found in a hobby shop and have the Simpsons family standing out the front. With the edges painted black this model really stands out and is a great little display to have especially if you're a Simpsons fan. I had a blast putting this together and don't forget that if you want to build this model for yourself be sure to check out my website for a link to the Tinkercad project file. I'll also put the PDF files for the windows, roof and internal support templates on my website as well. If you enjoyed watching don't forget to subscribe and if you'd like to help support the channel you can find me over on Patreon. Cheers and thanks for watching.